You will not kill. You will become dead, Marine. And Marines are not allowed to die without permission. Kubrick always wanted to make a stylized film about basically war, not necessarily the Vietnam War, but the phenomena of war. I think what he was very interested in doing was watching the transmutation of young men into killers, exploring the metamorphosis that occurs when you take young people and, in effect, brutalize them and inure them to a sense of right and wrong. Kubrick always looked for short form material that he could adapt, and he'd read about Gustav Hasford's The Short Timers in 79 in a publication called Kirkus Reviews. The reason he liked it was because it had humor, it was, it was full of craziness, and it was totally off the wall. And that's what Stanley always liked, surprises and off the wall things. The problem was, by the time he'd thought of making a film about the Vietnam War, which would have been around 79, all of a sudden, Apocalypse Now appeared. I don't believe that Kubrick was ever influenced very much by outside events. Um, his tendency was to let other people do the thing, and then he would come in and do the great one. Uh, he did that with Vietnam. He let everybody else do their Vietnam film, then he comes in with Full Metal Jacket. He contacted Michael Herr, who wrote um, a lot of Martin Sheen's dialogue for Apocalypse Now. Michael Herr was a great expert. He, did, he wrote this book, Dispatches. So he was a top authority on that period. They undertook what Herr has described as one phone call lasting three years with interruptions. And Herr would turn out draft after draft of the screenplay. So the buzz was in Hollywood. Stanley Kubrick's making a Vietnam movie. Well, you gotta get in that movie. Mr. Kubrick at that point was putting out his message that he was willing to look at anybody's audition tapes. So you had every actor in the world making these audition tapes and sending them off. Private Joker, are you trying to offend me? Sir, negative, sir! Sir, the private believes that any answer he gives will be wrong. And the senior drill instructor will beat him harder if he reverses himself, sir! Matthew Modine was shooting Birdie at the time that Kubrick first expressed an interest in him. And Alan Parker sent Kubrick some taped material of Matthew Modine doing his actorly bit, being the most birdie that he could be, thinking that this is how Stanley would see what Matthew Modine was capable of doing as an actor. But Stanley was looking for something different. And it was only because there was a little bit of extra tape at the end where you just saw Matthew Modine not speaking, not acting, but just kind of being, that gave Kubrick the idea that he wanted Matthew Modine in his film. He's a very good actor. At that time, he wasn't yet a superstar, but he had all the qualities to be one. I wanted to meet interesting and stimulating people of an ancient culture and kill them. I wanted to be the first kid on my block to get a confirmed kill. He was incredibly talented. He reminded me of a, a Jimmy Stewart. Very easygoing actor, very simple and electrifying on screen. Right shoulder! Oh, oh, Matthew was actually also instrumental in getting Vincent D'Onofrio, who had no film experience at the time. Um, Matthew and Vince had been friends since they appeared on stage together. I was working at the front door of the Hard Rock Cafe as a bouncer, and Matthew and his wife walked by, and I said, hey, man, where have you been? And he said he's doing this Kubrick thing, and, and that there was a part available. Hi, Joker. I didn't even think about being in film. I, I saw a lot of films, but I saw film actors as being very different people than myself. Clearly, he was a talented young actor. It has been proven because he made a big career since then. A talented young actor who was flexible and also was willing to put on the weight. He asked me early on, would I be all right with gaining this weight? And, you know, I said yes, and then I went over there and I gained about 30 pounds, and, and I remember him seeing it and saying that I only look like I could kick everybody's ass, so he thought some more weight would be needed, and I think it went up to 80 pounds. I think I went from two to 280. You cannot do one single pull-up! You are a worthless 
worthless piece of shit, pal! Now the problem is, when you bulk up for a Stanley Kubrick movie, you have to stay bulked up for God knows how long. You know, you don't know how long the shoot's gonna last. And I think that probably took its toll on Vince's body. The fucking war will be over by the time we get up there, won't it, Private Pile? People treat you differently when you're that size. And you know, you gotta remember, I, my head was shaved. So it was like a completely different persona from the, being this like long, lanky actor to a big, burly guy with a bald head. You know, it was a very strange life change. As far as I'm concerned, Vince turned out to be the best part of the film. Left shoulder! <laughs> right shoulder! <laughs> I'm not a uh, military type. I'm not um, turned on by it. I don't like guns. This is my rifle! There are many like it, but this one is mine! I'm an actor, and I know how to take apart an M16 and put it back together blindfolded. <laughs> Stanley made my career, there's no question to that. No question. I've done over 50 films because of him. Because of that part, because Stanley cast me. There is no other reason why I'm working. Easy, Leonard. Go easy, man. No! God was here before the Marine Corps. So you can give your heart to Jesus, but your ass belongs to the Corps. Do you ladies understand? Sir, yes, sir! We needed an advisor who, who told us exactly how the details work. For example, the movements that they do with the guns. A normal person doesn't know this. So we called an office in the United States that represents ex-Marines, and we asked for a drill instructor. Well, I found myself retired out of the Marine Corps uh, back in 1971, and I, I thought, well, I had no proper education, so really not much to fall back on. Got a phone call from Stanley Kubrick out of the clear blue one evening, and we talked about a full metal jacket, and he hired me as technical advisor. Because I am hard, you will not like me, but the more you hate me, the more you will learn. Our technical advisor comes in, and he starts yelling at us. I'm the boss, and this is that, and you're gonna do this, and you're a piece of shit. I'm like, whoa, who's this guy? This is your technical advisor. This is Lee Ermey. He's going to teach you how to shoot. You will not laugh. You will not cry. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. Lee Ermey was a drill sergeant, and he brought him in to drill the actors into a platoon and, and made them really work very hard. I think they got extremely fit on that film, the actors. Ten fucking seconds. It should take you no less than ten fucking seconds to negotiate this obstacle. We just uh, learned how to march like soldiers. I mean, there are scenes in that thing where it is us and it is for real and we look tight. We observed something very, very strange, namely that he then uh, went to wardrobe and put on a drill instructor's uniform. And he, in a way, fell back in his role. He wore the uniform and he changed his persona. He was a very nice man. And when he wore the uniform, he was a devil. I mean, he was a drill instructor, suddenly. Rebelly, rebelly, rebelly. I told Stanley that I would like to do Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, and he told me that he already had hired an actor. There was another guy who became the door gunner, Tim Colseri, who had the role. Ah Get some, baby! And Lee took it from him. I interviewed all the background extras, and I interviewed these people as Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, knowing that that has to go to Stanley Kubrick. I worked it out where Stanley had to watch me be his drill instructor, whether he liked it or not. Are you shook up? Are you nervous? Sir, I am, sir! Do I make you nervous? Sir! Sir, what? Are you about to call me an asshole? Sir, no, sir! How tall are you, Private? Sir, five foot nine, sir! Five foot nine, I didn't know they stacked shit that high. Stanley realized that it would be ideal if Lee actually could play the part. I think Lee was very, very clever. He got up, dressed up, and he did his stuff. And I believe that when Stanley saw that video, he just went, tear the script in half, we're rewriting this, put the cameras on Lee Ermey. This is my rifle, this is my gun, this is so fun, and this is so fun. 
we were also surprised about the language because, you know, I mean, all right, I mean, Stanley's script was, was fairly realistic, but Lee came up with phrases. I will gouge out your eyeballs and skull fuck you! That were more, say, picturesque. And it looks to me like the best part of you ran down to crack your mama's ass and ended up as a brown stain on the mattress. Astonishing, to say the least. I bet you're the kind of guy that would fuck a person in the ass and not even have the goddamn common courtesy to give him a reach around. Every time it was something else. I mean, he, he seemed to have an endless, um, yeah, endless resources on, on obscenities. I want that head so sanitary and squared away that the Virgin Mary herself would be proud to go in there and take a dump. So all of this amazing, fresh, impossible for a screenwriter to think up. Dialogue was spilling out of Ermi's um, mouth, and all they had to do was record it. I don't know, but I've been told. I don't know, but I've been told. Eskimo pussy is mighty cold. Eskimo pussy is mighty cold. And he is an, a natural actor, there's no doubt about it. Something he probably didn't know. Now you listen to me, Private Pile. And you listen good. I want that weapon. And I want it now. He's what makes that film really drive at the beginning. He makes it go. Happy birthday to you. I mean, when you look at Lee's work, he really is Paris Island. He really was that DI. Happy birthday. Stanley didn't like to travel, uh, and he wanted to do this film here. I mean, most directors would have gone to the Philippines or do something like that. Well, that was not an option for him. It seemed to be a preposterous idea to make a Vietnam movie in East London, but Kubrick had a bunch of reasons for shooting his films in, in England, the principal one being that he didn't like to do anything more than 10 miles from his house. The last time Stanley left England was to go to the premiere of 2001 in New York, and then he sailed. One of the biggest reasons he did the film was because there was this gas works, this abandoned gas works in East London called Beckton, and they were about to destroy it. But it had the same or very similar French architecture to the city of Way. And uh, we got the permission to topple buildings because it was derelict anyway. That hasn't been used since after the First World War. Anton First, who was the designer on it, just went round the place and said, well, if we, if we cut away these pillars on this building, it'll fall over on its side, sort of thing. And, and hey, presto, they did. And, and, and the building, sure enough, fell over. You know, it was, it was fairly straightforward. A apparently, it was quite hairy when they were doing it. The story goes that Stanley wanted to dynamite some of them, but they, they wouldn't let him. And what he would do is, in order to, to make it look even more like Vietnam, he flew in a bunch of palm trees. By adding the palm trees, you really did get the sense of it very quickly that you were over there. And I think they did a tremendous job, because most people don't believe that this was all done in East London, of all places, yeah. I am fucking bored to death, man. I gotta get back in the shit. I ain't heard a shot fired in anger in weeks. During the filming, I asked, how's this gonna go? This is gonna go slowly. And it was something none of us were used to. I don't think you can make films as well as Stanley does without taking that long. I just don't think you can. Originally, I was hired for 18 weeks, and of course, I knew it wouldn't be 18 weeks. It never is. I think he hires everybody for 18 weeks, and then <laughs> it just goes over and over. I believe it was about 17 months. I was brought in on the very first day, and I left on the very last day. Four months longer than tour of duty. It wasn't gonna be the short time tour of duty. It was gonna be, you know, potentially years off your life. And he was gonna put you through hell, you know, in his own inimitable way. You just didn't know when it was gonna end. It was mainly around the sequence where uh, Eight Ball and the Doc get shot by the sniper. <laughs> I know that Dorian stayed laying in the mud for a very long time. It 
we were on that wall for a month doing that scene, from the time we arrived to the time we all get across. That sequence kept us pinned down, literally, because every time they blasted the sides of the buildings, all the bullet hits had to be reset, and it took them about two or three days to reset all the bullet hits. The concussive effect that I got from those buildings, I had never experienced. And I had earplugs in, the whole thing, but just the explosions were so powerful that they would pound into my, into my eardrum. And I could only imagine what the real sound of real guns, close range, real bombs, and those things were like. All the actors, I think, were, to a man, very, very brave, because Stanley put them through it. He really did. The more that the actors are thinking, you know, when is this going to end? the more like the guys in Vietnam they become. None of this is lost on Stanley. He knows what he's doing, a very, very clever crafter of actors' psyches. And I'll always remember what he said to me in the, in the early going, and he said it to me, it was his mantra to me, the whole shoot. He said, Adam, you know, Adam, you're just not patient. I'll never forget that. The impression I had about him was that he was 99% visual, and I didn't think he knew that much or cared that much about acting, and I was wrong about that, because he did have a great eye for, for acting. Stanley likes actors that show up, know their lines, and don't bump into the furniture. And he doesn't want to hear anything else. He doesn't care about the motivation. He cares about it in the way that it better be right to tell his story properly, but he doesn't want to talk about it. Show up. Know your lines, don't bump into the furniture. Basically, that's it. He doesn't want to explain to an actor what he's looking for. He's already cast you. And anything you bring is good enough for him if it tells his story properly. If it doesn't, he'll say, do it better. Do it more interesting. He does use those terms. Doesn't say how to do it, what to do. You fucked up, do it again. He'll say it right to you right in front of everybody, no problem. You talk the talk. Do you walk the walk? Oh. At one point, Adam did his line. Stanley said, cut, OK, let's do it again. And Adam said something to the effect of, oh, man, what, did, you know, what does he want? As soon as he said this, there was a quick silence, because he's saying it, and, and the great Stanley Kubrick. And Stanley kind of leaned over from his camera how about better acting? And then he comes back over <laughs> and we all just like, whoa! Although everybody used to think Stanley was very precise about his filmmaking, he used to experiment a lot more than people realized. And at one point, he got all of the main cast together and he brought us into his motorhome. And he says, you know, I'm not sure how I want to end this film. You guys have any ideas? <laughs> and we all look at each other. Stanley Kubrick's having, asking us how we should end the, his film. In the script, and I believe it's still in my copy of the script, Animal Mother cuts the head off the, the sniper and throws it out of the building. Animal Mother had been carrying a machete on his back the whole show in order to do this one little thing. And so after Joker administers Coup de Gras, he wastes her and like, it's always oh, some big, important thing that we've wasted this little gook sniper. And Animal Mother takes umbrage at that. It's, like, it's not that important. He peels out his machete and lops off her head and picks it up. You know, they're all celebrating Joker. And Animal's like, here's the head. That's not a big deal. That's hard. That didn't make it into the film for reasons that Stanley never told me. It was too horrific, and unnecessarily so. Stanley was not out to, to do something sensational that is particularly horrible. He was always conscious of violence in his films. I talked to him about Clockwork Orange, which he always felt he'd overdone the violence, and that's why he had the control in England to, to ban it, and he banned it. After the movie was over and I was being interviewed about the movie, and I said in a complimentary way that Stanley was a perfectionist, and Stanley called me from England, he called my house. I'm not a perfectionist, I'm not a perfectionist. Why did you say I'm a perfectionist? I said, Stanley, you are a perfectionist. What do you think all those takes are? Stanley could spot a, a fly flying through the background of his movie at 100 yards and cut. 
Back up, let's do it again. I think the average was at least 30 takes. Yeah, maybe more. I stopped counting. Slower. Louder. Faster. Again. 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 Let's see what he does. Let's beat him down. Let's see what happens. The most takes that we ever did uh, with me. Holy Jesus. What do we have here, Private Powell? What is this, Private Powell? What the hell is this, Private Powell? What the fuck is that? What is that, Private Powell? Sir, jelly donut, sir. A jelly donut? Sir, yes, sir. 30-some takes. We got it. You are a disgusting fat body, Private Pyle! Sir, yes, sir! Most actors who have to shout a lot on a scene will hold back their voice a bit in rehearsals to try and maintain enough voice for the, for the performance because Lee gave it rock all from the moment he started, you know, and as a result, his voice just broke down. Lee was put through a lot of takes and held up. You know, his voice uh, was, was really very hard for Lee. His voice went out on him a lot. And the way I see it, ladies, you owe me for one jelly donut! Now get on your faces! The thing I remember most about the Full Metal Jacket experience is Stanley Kubrick. He was a one-of-a-kind person, and I was a student of Stanley Kubrick during that film. The only thing I can say about making a film with Stanley was you worked harder, I think, for Stanley Kubrick than any other director you worked with before. He was a, a difficult man. There's no two ways about it. He was very difficult at times. There were times when you'd gladly strangle him, but there were other times when you'd walk over broken glass to work with him. You know, you really would. He was the most patient man that I've ever met, and yet he could be the most impatient of tyrants behind the camera when he was ready and you weren't. People said of Kubrick, in another world, he would have been a general in an army. We were driving in Stanley's wife's SUV. Nice, brand spanking new, beautiful SUV. Somehow, Stanley talked her out of it that day. And we're looking for a place to do a scene. And Stanley's driving. It's how one track minded Stanley was. He was driving and he was pointing, he was saying, Doug, you see that? We're gonna set the troops up over here and we're driving. And in the meanwhile, I'm sitting there watching us drive slowly into a ditch. And the ditch is about six foot deep. Stanley drove, as he talked, he drove off into this ditch and the car went over on its side. Stanley reached up and did his seatbelt, he reached up and he pushed the door open and he climbed, <laughs> climbed out of the SUV and he climbed up on top and he's still talking. And we'll, we'll, we'll put up the tent over here and, and we're gonna have, we'll, we'll have base camp over here. Uh, Doug, get up here. And then he jumped off the side of the SUV and started walking down the road back toward base camp and looked back and said, well, come on. And we're all standing on the side of this SUV saying, do you believe this shit? We only hear their names in the very beginning of the film. I don't like the name Lawrence. Only faggots and sailors are called Lawrence. From now on, you're Gomer Pyle. After that, all we know are their nicknames. Making the transition from being a full-blown person with a name and a personality and your own identity to becoming this killing machine where you don't even have your own name anymore. You become something else. You become a weapon. I think that he wanted to take your, the, the people that you found sympathetic in the beginning and sort of break them down part by part until you realized that there was nobody left to root for and the only sympathy you could feel was not for the character necessarily as a human being but for what they'd lost as a human being. Green, what is that button on your body armor? A peace symbol, sir. Where'd you get it? I don't remember, sir. What is that you've got written on your helmet? Born to kill, sir. You write born to kill on your helmet and you wear a peace button. What's that supposed to be, some kind of sick joke? What is the significance of born to kill and the peace sign on Private Joker's helmet? 
it makes him almost literally bipolar. Peace guy on the one hand and has to kill to survive on the other. A visual illustration of that kind of moral purgatory that the film describes. There's no right or wrong, just getting the hell out and seeing your way through. Without having to explain it, Stanley wanted to indirectly suggest that these people are all masked. They have to in order to survive this. One of the most powerful effects that, it, that the movie had on me was kind of encapsulated in that one scene where Matthew Modine's character is in the helicopter and he asks the guy, How can you shoot women, children? <laughs> Easy. You just don't lead them so much. <laughs> Ain't war hell! <laughs> if you want the lesson of, of Vietnam, it is that one girl being up in a building, holding off a company of American soldiers, knowing she's gonna die. And her job is to somehow or other disrupt, kill, and basically delay no more than delay the progress of a company of American soldiers. That was Vietnam. I think a lot of the audience at that moment didn't know how to answer to that 12-year-old girl. It, it, it left you not resolved, no way to resolve. It left you at war's doorstep. These are the consequences. These are the unpredictabilities of war. These are babies. The end of the film, I think, is, is absolutely masterful. Very ambiguous. You know, this, you don't know exactly what happened. I mean, and why? Why is not they all march away and they sing the Mickey Mouse march? M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E Who's the leader of the club that's me? By making themselves boys again, little kids again, it makes what they had to do in order to deal with what they did deeper, darker, and more troubling. He told me that he was doing this film as his answer to Rambo. He said that, you know, with Rambo, it was you know, like come out of the water and it was glorifying, it, and he wanted to show what, what war was really like. Marines come up to me all the time, especially Marines, and they say, hey, this was the movie. This was really how it was. Full Metal Jacket is their Bible. I've heard from many Marines that just simply say that is the most accurate, truthful understanding of what Marine warfare is about. As a 22-year-old bad reporter, I was in Vietnam. I saw Full Metal Jacket with my wife in Westwood, and the lights went on, and I was a bit grumpy. And then I just started crying. And I really kind of cried uncontrollably for about 15, 20 minutes. There was something in that movie that got me in, in terms of evoking the experience of being there. I don't know, the film really hit me in a very, very strange, unexpected, and powerful way. I think the film holds up today just as most of Stanley's films hold up. They're timeless. I think he genuinely thought it was one of his best films, and I still think it's one of his best films. It's still one of the great war movies and seems better and better. Interestingly enough, the further you get from Vietnam. What's interesting about Full Metal Jacket is that it's about Vietnam, but God, I look at that movie, it's like Iraq. Kubrick was really making a statement about urban warfare, war in an urban environment. It's almost like Kubrick was talking about Vietnam, but he was also talking about future war, what we could be looking forward to. I think Stanley's commentary through his films is really, people, pay attention to what you're really doing, because we're playing for keeps now. If you destroy us, we don't have a second chance to come back and you're still playing the same dangerous game. 
Let me show you through art how dangerous it really is.